We've got four folks, we've got a lot more in the room who could speak to this, but we have four folks who have different perspectives on processing. And I want to say processing and beyond. How to connect with farmers, how to look at seeds, how to, how to really start this business within our region or any place in Florida or Georgia, Albert, um, to be sure. So what we're gonna do is bring them up. I said this this morning, but just as a reminder, 10 minutes apiece, and then we'll have 10 minutes Q&A for just that one person. They each have different perspectives, so we thought this might be helpful to really dig into um, what each of these individuals is talking about, and then we'll come back for a short um, conversation with all of them at the end, or simply continue the Q&A. Um, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities. We've heard this all day. We need processing, we need drying, we need all these different things. Wonderful business folks. Everyone's got a slightly different perspective on this. Some is gonna work, some is not. Some may work for you, but another system works for someone else. So this, we were really trying to give you a diversity of these perspectives um, to show you what's coming. So with that, and you all can all come up and sit with me or you can hang in the audience if you want. Um, Stay back in the audience. Hmm? Yeah, you can sit in the audience, Danny, that's okay, but you're going second. Um, so we've got, actually, Danny, you're going first. That's right, forgive me. So you can sit in the audience. Danny Prasard with Danica Farms. We will follow that with Keely um, Stiff from um, Red Hills Hemp, who you saw this morning. And then Albert Etheridge from Pretoria Fields Collective. And last but not least, Alan Witters, um, Gravitas Infintium. Did I get that right, Alan? I always, okay, I'll let you say it properly later. Um, and as I've said all day, Danny, I'm gonna get back to the, <laughs> you are not gonna have to use much of anything here. Um, because we're gonna come right back in here. And there you go. You're right there. Yes, sir. Okay. That's it. All right. All right. Thank you all very much. And thanks for sticking around for the afternoon. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Danny Prasad. I'm the CEO of Danica Farms. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Danica Farms and my history and uh, why I got into it as much as you guys are probably looking to get into the hemp business. Uh, 2014, I was called out to Colorado to help them on the banking side. Uh, my history is 29 years uh, CEO of the Armored Car Banking Company. We're the largest independent armored car company in the Southeast United States. Um, they called me out there to help them figure out their banking problems. They took absolutely none of my advice. Zero. <laughs> so that being said, while I was out there, I really started investigating the cannabis side and, and what the benefits were. And then uh, a couple of my friends showed me the hemp side, and I was really intrigued with hemp. So since 2014, I've been touring the entire country, uh, from farmers to extraction facilities to scientists to I mean, you name it. Anyone in the industry, I've learned ton of things from, and I'm still learning. Um, I've spoken at the 850 Summit in Tallahassee. Uh, um, Al and I spoke at the, uh, the uh, big kickoff one in Orlando two weeks ago. Um, so we, we've met a lot of interesting people, doctors, scientists, you name it. So why Danica Farms? Um, last year, and I, I tell the story of where I go, and I told it to my table over there. Um, I had a major incident, life-changing incident to my health uh, in uh, March of last year and decided I was going to retire and get out of everything. I uh, told my wife, I said, hey, that's it. I'm done. I'm out. She says, what are you going to do? I am buy a farm. We live in the city, by the way. Okay, We live in a big city. Um, she laughed at me and said, uh, you know, you're out of your mind. What do you think you're doing? I said, well, we'll see. So within a day or two, uh, uh, person responded back to me and I bought a 400 acre farm. Um, when I went up there to see the farm, I was there for about an hour and a half. And about three or four farmers that have been dairy farmers, peanut farmers, uh, uh, whatever, you, you know, farming for, for three, four, five generations. 
those individuals had a profound effect on me. And what I mean profound, they told me, one particular client told me, third or fourth generation dairy farmer, they've lost a farm. He's now mowing yards on the side of the road. His daughter was uh, working two jobs to help him pay for his house. And he's 65 years old and battling cancer. Now, me being from humble beginnings myself, um, I got it. I got it real quick. And one thing I can tell you, I understand business. I'm not a farmer. Like I learned farming, but I understand business. I told Clint that day and then the guys there in that town, we're gonna help you. So Danica Farms was formed, like within weeks. And I told them we're gonna start growing hemp. And I'm gonna show you how to do it. So that being said, I partnered up with a team up in Maine. And if you guys see me after, and some of you guys saw me in Tallahassee or in Orlando, I'll show you the pictures. The trees they're growing are insane. When I see trees, they look like trees. Um, the hemp are, you know, they're eight, 10 feet tall, they're six feet wide. Um, you know, it's, it's insane. So that going back to the farmers, you know, the, what they said to me, if you, if you care about people and you have a passion for helping people, you gotta do something, you know, if you're put in that situation, if you're blessed with you know, whatever ability, you gotta do something. And I feel that we were blessed, you know, I was given a second chance in, in life. Uh, I don't mind sharing, I had a heart attack, okay? So um, I was given a second chance to help people, and I, I plan on doing it. So Danica Farms was formed, um, and I don't wanna bring the situation down, but Danica Farms was formed, um, decided to help the farmers. Uh, Danica Farms means one who brings light into the world. Therefore, the name Danica is named after my baby daughter at the same time as having a baby girl. So, uh, met Christian um, in Tampa, uh, what, four or five months ago? Six months ago, something like that? Three? three? Maybe three, I don't know. <laughs> seen a lot of people, seen a lot of people. And uh, she asked me, you know, I heard about theirs, you know, what you're doing and what you plan on doing. So, our goal is not only to do the extraction, crude, full spectrum oil, which a lot of you guys are talking about, our end game is packaging. Our again the game is fiber. So we want to eliminate or, or try to eliminate as much plastic there is out in the world. There is a big push for eliminating bags. There's a big push for eliminating, you know, grocery bags, straws, bottles, you know, hempcrete. There's concrete made from hemp. Uh, you'll see some of my slides in a minute and it'll give you some of those uh, information that's up on the uh, bulletin board up there. Um, we have scientists that have been working with us, some of them uh, 30, 40 years in chemical engineering. Uh, one of our scientists is, is, I mean, the guy graduated with four degrees at the same time, um, you know, for Car Carnegie Mellon. So, you know, these guys know what they're doing. So we're putting together one heck of a team. Uh, we plan on building not one, but two extraction facilities, our processing centers, you should call it, uh, one on this, this coast, and one on the east coast, one on the east, one on the west coast, the I-10 corridor. So you will have somewhere to take your product to. Um, one thing about extraction or processing or manufacturing, uh, you got to have three things. You got to have a good farmer, you got to have a good processor, and you have to have a good end user, a buyer. So whatever you guys decide to do, and I'm hearing a lot of things over there, I just want to make sure you guys are clear on that. Whoever you decide to partner with for processing or extraction or manufacturing, make sure they have contracts in place with, with other companies, other clients internationally that are going to buy it from you. Because, you know, they process it for you and they do the tolling and, you know, they're going to sell their 50%. What are you going to do with your 50%? Where are you going, where are you going to put it? Backyard? It's going to go to waste. Okay, so make sure you have those things and ask the processor. Question them. It's your money. It's your time. Okay? Question them. Hey, what are you going to do with this? How are you going to sell this? You know, what's the split? So make sure those, those certain questions I want you guys to be aware of. But on the manufacturing side, we have buyers right now in place that are looking to buy fiber from us. We're working with one, uh, one of the largest corporations. He's based out of Fort Lauderdale. And he wants, to, he wants to do a $5 million investment with us, and we supply fiber to him, and he would then make T-shirts and hats, stamp his, uh, stamp his logo on it, and sell it and see how it works. And if it does, then it could be 10, 15, 20 million, and go on up down the road, you know? So these are things we're looking at every single day. And we're looking at not only American partners, we're looking at international partners, because hemp has been around for a long time. Hemp is all over the world, and you know, we just gotta get in the game. So, that being said, I put together a, a slideshow. Um, our vision, you know, 
it is what it says. You know, we want to make eco-friendly sources. You know, cultivate new products. Be sustainable. Opportunities. I mean, if you want to invest, that's one thing. I'm not here to talk about that, but you know, these are the uses. Lots of uses here. So obviously, Chris said paper, food, and medicine, building materials, textiles, fuel. Kind of shows you what the stock is used for. Whether it be fiber, herd, seeds. Um, I've heard 25,000. Uh, I talked to a guy in Italy, and he said 50,000. So we went up to 50,000 because we talked to some of our scientists, and they agree it's 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 a, you know it's like an infinite number it seems. Um, here's your paper products. You know, hemp crops yield up to 10 acres per ton, four times more than trees. You know, and these these are my numbers. These are like scientific information. Um, Maturity rate versus trees. And I'm out here to knock the tree industry, so please do not be offended. Um, four months, every four months you can harvest, give or take. You know, trees. I heard 18 years, I've heard 50 to 100 years, depending on what the tree is. You know, so you can get it back. Um, hempcrete versus concrete. You know, hempcrete six times stronger than concrete. That's proven fact. There's actually a hemp house in Tarpon Springs, I believe. You know, it's all hempcrete. And the guy swears by it, and I'm, I'm waiting for the hurricane to come through and see if it works, but you know, he swears by it. You know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, the tonnage, you know, the yields. You know, the big thing is, is, is the CO2 for us, CO2 reduction. You know, these are, these are facts. These are actual, you know, real facts here. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to work with cultivation, propagation. We will work with everything. And one thing I said at the beginning, so back to the farmers. We, we made that statement to our farmers. We're going to help all the farmers out. So if you are a farmer, we're going to set up a classroom. So every, every month on the weekend, maybe a Friday, Saturday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, once a month, we're going to have farmers come to class free of charge. Okay, free of charge. We're going to teach you best practices how to grow. And like I said, I can show you what we're doing and working with South Carolina right now, working with Kentucky right now. We are working with, uh, I can show you what we're doing in Maine, um, you know, and we're gonna bring those guys in. And those guys are experts. I mean, they've been around forever growing either cannabis, you know, legally or illegally, or, <laughs> or, uh, or uh, you know, growing hemp. So they know what they're doing, you know. And, uh, you know, I think it's a good fit to try to bring, bring this group together with those farmers to learn the best practices on how to grow, what works. And also with the University of Florida, uh, Dr. Jerry over there, that's a wealth of knowledge, so. Uh, there's, what well, I was saying, our goal is to educate farmers, you know. If you guys succeed, we succeed. And that's the bottom line. We wanna make sure you guys have all the tools you need to succeed. We become partners, we work together, and maybe we we'll all make a little bit of money together. Um, Processing facility, once again, back to what I was saying, education techniques, cultivation, <coughs> helpful materials. That's crude. So if you guys are not familiar with what it looks like, it looks just like what it is, oil. It looks like crude oil, you know? Um, that's kind of our time chart there. Uh, connecting with farmers, we really started uh, in September. Um, we have about 15 or 18 farmers that we've locked into already, and we're looking for much more. Um, some own 13, 14,000 acres. They're not going to grow that much. You know, they might grow five or 10 acres the first year, which is a good number. Uh, but if they do well at that, then they'll go on double it next year or double it next year and compound from there. Um, cultivating crop, we figure August or September. Uh, I've heard October as well. Um, in Maine, we, we did it at the beginning of August. You know, so. Whatever works best in Florida, that's the time you're going to cultivate. There's, there's the, all the flowers well. There's a greenhouse, which, you know, if you guys have some greenhouses, or, or I heard, heard some people converting the chicken houses into greenhouses uh, and drying houses, because there's a lot of chicken houses up here. I mean, I ran into a tons of, ton, ton of them, and that's a drying process as well. You can use that as well to dry your product. Um, we're going to invest in the communities. The biggest thing with me is creating jobs, and when I say creating jobs, I, li I like working with, with the underdog. I like working with a person that, you know, needs a little help to get to the next level. So not only are we doing that, um, we have an initiative to work with at-risk kids too. So kids that come from single homes or or or, uh, or in bad situations whatsoever, 
and they're willing to learn how to do this, we're willing to teach them. And that's all I got to say, so thank you for your time. Oh, it's Q&A time. Yes. Oh, okay. I thought, I thought it was at the end. Okay. No. All right. Yeah, see, they won't listen to that. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you got 10 minutes or however long we need. We got one starting over here, and Clayton will be running around again. Okay. Well, thank you. So Danny and Mark will be doing full process? Yes. And it will be 50-50 Yes. Yeah, so we, we'll do both. We'll do the toll, the 50-50 split, or if you want us to extra, extract for you and give you back your stuff, there's going to be a price per pound. Did you know that? Uh, I do know that, but I'm not going to give that out here. I will talk to individual farmers when we become team, team players. I can hear you. I don't know if they can hear you. On the, I'm going to say right now on the I-10 corridor, we're in negotiations with four different counties right now that want, there's two facilities going up. There's four different counties on the I-10 corridor right now that we're talking to that want a facility there. And they're not small either. I think the smallest is 50,000 square feet. The largest is 110,000 square feet. So that, that number you heard earlier is 75 million. Yeah, yeah, it, could, it could be. It could be. What sort of extraction process are you guys? So we're, we're my guys, my science guys are on the ethanol side, so they deal with ethanol. Ethanol? Uh-huh. Okay. You mentioned about <clears throat> replacing the plastic mm -hmm. for uh, in the grocery bags or something like that. Mm -hmm. What is the cost effectiveness of that? Would this well, be cheaper we, than that? Or? We, we, well, right now it's probably not going to be cheaper. It's, it's going to be a little more expensive. But if you look at the long-term sustainability of, of your, your kids and your grandkids and the future, you know, we can't have plastics fill up our, our landfills. We can't have plastics all over the, all of the earth. You know, it's going to be a cost to it, absolutely. You know, but are you willing to spend that cost now? Or are you going to say, you know what, I don't care what happens to my kids and my grandkids. You know, that's the way I look at it. What's the, the uh, biodegradable rate of plastics? So, so I, think, I think plastics are like forever, it seems. No, 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 but the bio, but the, the we, well, the, the hemp material we're working on, 120 to 160 days. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So basically, you could, grind, you could really grind it right back into the earth if you wanted to. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it'll, it'll degrade after a time. There's gonna be there's gonna be like a stamp on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. But we just won't make as much of that. We just yeah. Absolutely. Sir. Ron, in Ron in Tennessee, we saw many of the small farmers are planting directly into the ground cover crop. Clover does very good through the summer. Uh, up there, it burns up down here. We're talking with Ibis about uh, perennial peanut or some other type of ground cover. What you're trying to do is you're trying to limit the weed growth. If you've got a ground cover there, the legumes, like the clover, that's going to help you on your on your soil, and you, you're not using the plastic. But we just don't have a ground cover here that works as good as it does up there. Did, you, did I understand you to say that in these facilities that you're looking at in the I-10 corridor, you're going to be processing fiber as well as the CBD side? That's correct. Our focus, though, our primary focus is on the fiber side, but obviously you may have 10 acres of, of flour you want to be you know, processed, and we're not going to turn it away if it's good, if it's good flour. We will start building. We will make a decision with the counties in the next 30 days. So our bill, our building uh, will definitely start by January at some point. We own land on, in certain parts already, and we're talking about other things right now. So I'll say by January, somewhere we break ground. The, the, the equipment and machinery that's already been purchased is just sitting right now. 
So all we gotta do is transport that in and uh, hire, hire labor and bring our team down. Yeah, we want we want we want to stay in that ten to fifteen range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How big a facility would be, and uh, you are looking into it, and what kind of investment you got? So, so the the facility, we have two blueprints. We have fifty thousand square feet and a hundred thousand square feet. We're looking at a two hundred and twenty-five thousand square feet in South Florida, but we're not focused on that too much right now. But we are looking at that. Um, job creation, if, if you're looking at the extraction side, you're looking 10 to 15, you look at the manufacturing side, it could go from 50 to 100, depending on what we're doing, because we're going to be moving a lot of products in there. You know, when you're talking about one of the farmers that we've talked to has, you know, like say 10 to 13,000 acres, and if you go on the fiber side, that's a lot of stuff coming in. You know, that's a lot of stuff. That's, I mean, that's 24 hours a day, trucks coming in during harvest. You know, so we're going to have a lot, of, a lot of people there, and then you got the shipping side that has to go out. So whether we do by truck or whether we do by train, you know, it's got to go somewhere. So it, it's going to help a lot of people. Uh, quick question for you. Um, what technology are you using for your extraction? Everything from supercritical CO2 to uh, organic solvent extraction, what are you going to use as your platform for extraction? So the extraction process ethanol, and, you know, we are working, we are working with a team right now in Carolina. We are working with a team in California. And our scientists, I, I can't really give out their names right now, but I, I will at a later time frame, uh, those guys can build it from the ground up. They are four of the most brilliant-minded people I've ever been around, 125 years of experience uh, in one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And basically, they came out of retirement to try to make this work. You mentioned your background was in ag banking. Um, wait, now wait. that you're currently in no, uh, the pro no, my background is not in ag banking. My background is armored car and banking. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Armored car and banking. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, being the large audience here is probably uh, farmers entertaining the idea of growing this crop. Mm -hmm. uh, being now you're a processor, do you have any advice or, uh, you know, points that you would give them, you know, if they're looking at transitioning from a different type of crop? into uh, hemp for CBD or for grain and fiber? Sure, um, so learning and the things I've learned for all the different farmers, including what we did up north, you know, start with something small. You know, make sure whatever you're getting into, you know, it's just it's an investment. Make sure you can afford to lose it, you know, because you could, in you know, the first year you could lose it. So make sure that, you know, you're not the, 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 the person that says, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be a millionaire overnight, I'm throwing all this into it, and then all of a sudden, you know, the hurricane comes through or, you know, too much water, too much whatever. So I would say small, you know, start small, start, you know, five acres. You know, if you're a big farmer, start about five, ten acres. If you're a small farmer, maybe do an acre or two, you know, and, and kind, of, kind of do your, your own R&D and figure out what works best for you and best for your area and, and take it from there. You know, um, with seeds, genetics and cloning and all that stuff. So uh, I'm not going to get into that too much, but there are some things you got to look in, you know, look into that about, you know, cloning someone else's genetics. So I heard that earlier, so kind of be careful with that. Um, you know, as far as creating your mother houses, you know, and do, and do your cloning or propagate from that. Um, so I would take it, like I said, I would take it slow, make sure you understand what you're doing inside and out. You know, and that's where we're gonna do it too. We're not gonna start extracting, you know, 100,000 pounds a day. You know, we might do a couple hundred, you know, the first week. And then the second week, we might do a couple thousand and make sure we know what the heck we're doing and make sure it's working out right for us. Because we tried this in Maine and it didn't work out so well. We tried the drying process up there, so they had an industrial dryer up there. And the heat, they turned up the heat a little bit too much. And basically, you know what happens then. It ruined the whole thing. Um, we are working with an insurance company for us, but we don't necessarily are going to focus on growing. We did the growing just for research purposes to see what works best. Um, but we are working with an uh, international insurance company, uh, the biggest one actually. So, and I'll be more happy to talk to you outside about that. Absolutely. Okay, you're gonna get a few more minutes with Danny. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as Keely's coming up to join us, you are gonna get a few more minutes with Danny and all of the, everyone at the end. We're just gonna move through these four presentations. Great question about insurance. 
um, just oh. as Keeley's moving up here. Um, I had a conversation with a couple of local agents recently and they're starting to explore this. So some of the professional services that we need for the industry, we're gonna try to find more answers about that. So keep those questions coming. All right, so Keely Siff, um, again, you got an introdu introduction earlier um, as a member of the FDAX Advisory Council, um, but now we're gonna hear a little bit more about the business side. And there's your clicker, so. All right, it's yours, thank you. So Kristen's pulling me out of my shell and my love for public speaking here. Um, so forgive me for, so I made, this, these notes are more for me, really, to try to remember what to say, because I know I don't like speaking public. But I figured you guys were gonna get a lot of details and processing. I am not a scientist, I'm not a clinician, and we are gonna do solvent-based extraction. Um, so, you know, primarily ethanol. We're not gonna get into supercritical CO2. There are other ways to get to an inline, but that we probably are not going to be a final production group. We're gonna be a midline processor. Um, we are also building a very large facility. It is um, gonna be in Quincy. We have, we have the building. We have started the specs. I've got engineers working on it right now. We've also brought in scientists. I mean, this is a team of people. So, you know, there's elements of this where I'm really outside of my element and giving you the, the specific details of processing. We will do toll processing. We're gonna do 50-50 processing. We are also gonna stay in those same CBD levels. Um, I think one of the biggest issues, I don't know how to use this. Oh, okay. There we go. I think that might Oh, there we go. Okay, so we've talked a lot today about harvesting and, and getting a successful harvest. That's your first step. So we're talk, talking, about, talk, talking about the soil. Uh, hip, I don't think anybody's talked about the taproot. It can be up to 24 inches. So when you are doing soil testing, realize that depending on what you are just testing for, sometimes you're gonna, you're, you're gonna wanna want to know what the nutrients are in the soil that helps you prepare the fertilizer. And there are a lot of people that are gonna come and look at some custom fertilization op opportunities for this industry, and I'm sure there's some from this area. Um, it will also need to test for contaminants. We are gonna have a list of contaminants in the soil that we are gonna to wanna to test for. Heavy metals, residuals, things like that. So we're gonna to wanna to see that before we agree to you know, get into business with you because if you guys have these contaminants in your soil, it's gonna come up through your plant and your, print, your plant's not gonna be processable for anything that would be consumable. And so that's something to remember just on the front side of it. Um, planning ahead for your harvesting and drying options. So. We've got these new rules and we're trying to work with the new rules, but probably everybody in here is gonna hand harvest and that takes time. It takes time, so, so suggesting that you stage your planting so you're staging your harvesting, knowing it's gonna take a lot of manpower, knowing that there's gonna be time on the ground, knowing that there's a learning process involved in this because if you've started now and you've got 15 days until you get to the end of your crop, you could lose your CBD, your, C your THC could spike, you're gonna have variables coming just from that same crop during your harvesting process. So that's something that you're gonna to wanna to think about. Talk to some people that have been doing this. I would actually encourage, if you're really looking at doing something small, figuring it out, you don't wanna experience loss. Maybe if you and your neighbors are looking, somebody host it, put some money together, you guys figure out what your needs are for that first crop. And, and then maybe you can then expand from there. You guys aren't gonna be competing with each other. You're probably, co-ops are very successful in these models. People can work together. You're gonna to work with processors. Processors then are kind of dealing with the same. So, so there's better communication and there's a bit of the ease of the burden of just getting right into the industry. Um, understanding your labor and equipment needs. So people have been talking about combines. One of the things about combines is most of them are retrofitted in some way. Um, I was truly talking to a friend of mine outside who was on his way to Oregon and he, was, he says, I'm in Salt Lake City, I'm headed to Oregon, we're trying to figure out if we're gonna be able to sell our crop this year because we don't meet USDA guidelines. We meet the guidelines now, but we're not sure if the DA is gonna come take our crop. But one of the things we were talking about in the harvest is how they pick the flower. So flowers become a very big sellable part of CBD other than just the processing for oils. People are selling the flour. It is replacing cigarettes for people that want a more holistic way to smoke. And so you've got your A bud, your, C, your B bud, and your CBD bud. And so if you are going to harvest in that fashion, you're in a pretty heavy labor force. And we're lucky in this community because, and in the panhandle in general, because we do have farming communities, we do have rotating labor forces. So 
I don't remember what all is picked right during that harvest time, so who you might be competing with in a harvest, but understand what you might be coming into, making your budget to do that, and getting, you know, going ahead and planning ahead as you guys are getting plants in the ground. Um, and are you selling outright? Are you processing for your own needs? So, so that's another thing to consider. There are some people, my mom's always wanted to make soap when we think CBD oil, she makes it in her garage, and I'm gonna get to it just in a minute. Um, you know, how some of that might work under state guidelines. And, you know, the final question to ask yourself, who are you selling it to? You know, Georgia does have those laws with the processors. We do not. We have some great people, like you just spoke to or just heard from, you're gonna hear some other people that are getting into this. But, but it would be good to communicate with anybody that you know that's in the processing side, depending on how far you're gonna take the plant, what, how they will accept the plant, and what your relationship may be. And I don't know how many people in here have been in the timber industry and how that may work and how many of you lost something. We were, we were affected during Hurricane Michael. And one of the biggest issues was you know, there were mills that were knocked out. You had all this timber. Either you needed to get it off the ground or get it that was broken and try to get it to a mill. Well, if the mills aren't taking anything, you can't do anything with it. And it's a total loss. Make sure you have somewhere to sell this or you have a plan before you put it in the ground or you can end up in that same concept where you don't have anywhere to sell it. So because you haven't had the testing, you haven't had the certain protocol. So I'm not sure how everybody's gonna do it, but, but try to have that conversation and protect yourself. Okay, so this might not be as, this is something that just had been a big question. And so I put it in here as, as I was actually on a phone call the other day and somebody was talking about it. So this is the standard for testing that we now have in Florida. It's, it is the same measure that we have um, coming down from the USDA. And what, this, what differentiates this from a lot of other states and a lot of other states that potentially have um, certified seeds is it's a very, very strict measurement for THC. It is a difficult bar to meet. And we have some great people, hopefully in Florida, that are trying to make sure that bar gets met. This is a challenge. Now, hemp might not be hard to grow. There, it, it, it's not. It needs some babying. But, but this is a big challenge for all of us to try to figure out. And it's something to pay attention to. It's something maybe to understand a little bit in this level, but it is something that's going to affect all of us as we migrate through this industry and, and try to figure out how we can meet this standard at the, at the first phase, which is going to be during cultivation. Okay, so this is, a, this is a map that discusses all of the, um, I guess it's in both places. So it discusses all of the states. You can see the, the color, the one that just tests for Delta 9. We test for total THC and some that are a bit ambiguous. And so Alabama, which could have been a great resource potentially for us for seeds because at least down in this area, I mean, you guys are buttoned up to very similar seasonal climates. Their seeds will not qualify here in Florida, just at, at a basic level. Now, there, there might be some we can dig into, but at a fundamental level, their seeds do not qualify legally to grow here. Or when the, once they are cultivated, the, the, peop, the, the plants that have been cultivated there were not tested in a way that would qualify here. We, they, they have a much more generous testing process. That is different than what the USDA says. So all of those states that are green have a, have a much more liberal testing process, and they were, they were processing it out you know, in, the, in the processing facilities. Um, there are some that are darker, the total THC, but at a state level, even though they're doing total THC, they might not have been strictly at that point three. There, was, there were some margins of error and things like that that were a bit more generous. So this is something for us to look at and, and realize there's a lot of upheaval in the country right now in trying to implement that USDA rule at a state level. We don't know what the enforcement is. We don't know what the action is. I was saying I have a friend out in Oregon. They're trying to figure out if they can sell the crops that they planted under Oregon law, and they're not sure if you know, the DA is going to enforce it. But the reason I put this here is there's opportunity. There's huge opportunity there coming up because this whole system that wasn't well rooted anyway just got rattled. And now we're coming into it, and we're coming in into it under the guideline that meets state federal requirements. So while we're, you know, kind of feel like we're a little last to the party in some instances, just know that there, there just a huge door just opened for us. 
a huge door that just trying to level the field and we can still get into it and not, mess, not necessarily feel so far behind. So that's why I put this up there. Okay, so what is processing? So this is what, you know, couple, okay. Um, the, so this is our rules. Process plant, plant material means plant matter includes whatever. Um, is processed in such a manner that makes it ineffective to host plants, pests, or disease. So that allows us to do a lot of this at home, is the point, depending on what you're trying to do with the plant and in what way you're trying to sell it. So if you are, are trying to do flower, trying to do a, a home operation and, and sell the flower in that way and you have channels to do that, you can do that. So you're not going to end up having to get a processing license, which is a pretty extensive license in the state right now. Um, so it was just to really kind of let you know kind of wh where we fall in as processors and what step that kind of takes. Um, and what are you growing for? So when, we're gonna, when you're trying to figure out how you're going to sell it and what you're going to sell it for, it's, it's figuring out what you're going to grow for. This has already been covered extensively, but I just wanted to make sure that as you're looking at that, you're looking at where your supply chain sits. And testing. So testing is a big part of this. We have, a we have several strategic relationships. One of them is with a testing facility who we will end up having to use and have relationships with the farmers that we are working with in, in helping test through the process. That was definitely explained a lot. It's critical. It's critical to do your own testing. It's something that we're going to want to help you protect your investment, protect our relationship. And it's something that you're going to want to see kind of where that goes in the cycle. And what are your next steps? Okay, so I, there are different ways. That's the link that I had on my computer. So fdex.gov back, backslash cannabis. But stay informed. This is, if you have not been in regulated industry before, welcome to it. Okay, he, this is something that you're going to want to watch. You're going to want to know what's going on in the political cycle. Watch the news, read the articles, pay attention to the FDEX. Call in on those numbers if you can get them off the FDEX site. See what we are talking about on those calls and ask questions and make comments and, and try to get that, that conversation stimulated. This is a great investment if you, if you take that step and decide to make it, but you're going to want to stay educated and know what's going on around, around your community, around the state, and around the country that directly affects this cultivation process. And just have a plan that we've talked about. So just make sure you're getting into it safely and responsibly. Perfect. Thank you. Got your first hand up, so I'll see I was trying to stall there, Quentin. Yeah. He's running over to you. So thank you very much, Keely. Another round and then we'll get right into our next one. Thank you. We are, we are planning to process fiber. I'll tell you what my hold up in getting that machine that's not cheap to do it on an industrial level is to make sure we have places to sell it. So in the same, in the same breath, we have, we have been working with on an international basis with a couple of, of relationships. There are some people that are specifically trying to get the fabric out of, or get the fiber out of Florida for fabric, but we want to make sure we have a place to sell it before we make that investment. We do have the building, we have the property, and right now we're trying to figure out how we compartmentalize some of it to, to separate exactly what we're doing. And we're trying to figure out also if we are gonna have a drying facility, because drying is a really, really critical part about this that hasn't been touched on that much today. Um, we, our greatest enemy is the humidity and the heat, and that is a big problem in drying. So self-drying has not been hugely successful in some of these lower states. And it needs to be in a climate control place with a dehumidifier in the darkness. I mean, there's just a lot that needs to be discussed. And, and I think that might be a missing link for today in, in really understanding that part. We have not created those contracts yet. Um, but yes, we. Being from this region, we have had we have been approached by a lot of people to to purchase their product, um, and we are working with them um, to try to figure out a plan for how much they want to grow and how much we're going to purchase and process. What we've been doing really on the front side, knowing that there there will be an abundance of people wanting to get into the, 
to the field at various levels is we've wanted to make sure that we have the supply chain complete. So we've gotten a couple of really great contracts in the state, very large um, in, inline consumers and, and white labelers. So we're trying to figure out and make sure that we have the purchasers before we start to enter into those contracts. I'm good? Oh, hi. Uh, Connie, would you cover about the, Connie, would you cover the part about, uh, you talked about your mother wanted to make soap and things like that. Um, would you, you're not able to sell this at the, at the farmer's market. You've got the, well, you've got the processor and a certified kitchen and a, a, a facility and then you can sell it, but you can't just sell it, make it in your bathtub and take it down to the farmer's market. Did you get that? I did. So, no, you, you would have to get, and, and there, there is, has been conversation in, uh, about having a community certified kitchen for people who do want to do small batch processing. And so that would be something, once again, to try to work with some people. If you do want to make soaps, if you do want to make, you know, handmade lotions, there, just like there is a market everywhere else for, for boutique items, there is a market in this industry for that. But it is definitely making sure that you can get in those under the state guidelines. But, but I have heard conversations about people looking at trying to get a, a center, you know, a place like this essentially certified and be able to have some sort of share time used in it. Good? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, as uh, our next presenter, Albert Etheridge, joins me from um, Pretoria Fields Collective in Georgia, coming back to this question about the certified um, space to do consumables or anything like that. This is in line with some of the projects, I just gotta give a little plug. Planning Council works on these types of projects if there is a Economic Development Administration grant or something like that, a regional food distribution hub, for example. Those are ideas that have come up in the past. So keep a hold of this idea. If, if we need that as a regional asset, that may be something we can build on in the future. So great question. All the great questions. Thank you. All right. Albert, you're up. There you go. How's everybody doing? We only got a few more laps and we'll all be able to get, get out of here and take in this fire hose of information before the day is over. Uh, my name is Albert Etheridge. I'm with Torrey Fields Collective. We're out of Albany, Georgia. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of uh, what we do and then how we ended up coming to the meeting today. Um, the Morgan family, Harris spoke a few minutes ago and as well as his son, they're fourth, fifth generation farmers. They've been farming for as long as they can think about it. And it's an important part of what their life has all been about. Um, the owner of our company, Dr. Tripp Morgan, is a vascular surgeon and he's a pharmacist as well. And so when this opportunity came around um, recently, uh, we, we had already been doing some things. Um, and the big thing we've been doing is uh, organic farming. We've got a couple hundred acres that we do blueberries, blackberries, we grow just anything and everything you can think out there. Uh, sustainable agriculture, that's the, that is the reason why we get out of bed every day, is to work with farmers throughout the state of Georgia as well as the, the region that we live in, and natural resource management. So our goal is relationships through farming. We started our current farming initiatives under Pretoria Fields Collective in 2014. Um, and the whole goal behind that was uh, Dr. Morgan wanted to get some farms closer to where we lived in Albany, Georgia. And uh, he had an affinity for it from working with his dad growing up. And then uh, we started a brewery uh, a couple years later. Uh, everything we grow on our farms uh, goes into our beer. We're the only beer in Southeast that uses as much as uh, all of our inputs in our beer up to 85 percent and i know this this is going somewhere so hopefully y'all bear with me um and we are actually the brand of choice for georgia grown with the department of agriculture so we work really closely with the department of agriculture with our farming as well as our our brewery and we've found a lot of favor there so this year um you know when the farm bill came around oops sorry about that this is supposed to have something else on the bottom, but I think the, uh, the text got messed up. So we started talking about what did we want to do to get into hemp? 
And we realized very early on that hemp, this whole thing, most, just look around the room at the people around you. If you're from this region, you'll probably get to know them very well before this is all said and done. Because this, this is a relational thing, okay? From, from whomever you get your, your seeds or your clones from, your, your, your irrigation, your fertigation, just uh, helps you put your land together, do your testing, get it ready to take to the processor. Um, then you get it to the processor, excuse me, and then the processor helps get it sold on down the line. This is about people and relationships at the end of the day. It's about helping farmers and communities. It's about putting great resources back into folks who've worked hard for a very long time. This is not a business about making money. And um, I appreciate uh, the, the doctor that stood up earlier. One of the things a lot of people get the impression about, especially on the CBD side, is that you just throw this stuff out on the ground, you do whatever, and then you're gonna end up making a lot of money doing it. And that's, I think, part of the tenor is people are wanna caution people about trying to make a killing off of doing this. Um, you have to get into uh, the CBD side, then that's a great thing. Let's just take your time, do it right, and be careful. But just as important is the fiber side. That is going to be huge in the next five years as the CBD side kind of hits his stride and, and tapers off. And the reason is, is because just like uh, they showed you earlier with Danica Farms, that's gonna be something that replaces a, a lot of um, our, our, our paper and wood and things of that. So what I was gonna do um, is one more thing. In the state of Georgia, we are tied to the farmers. So you can't get a uh, processor license unless you actually work with a farmer and vice versa. They set it up that way because they wanted all of us to learn to work together to do best practices and to be successful. Uh, I know that's kind of strange in a lot of ways, but it'll all help us work together. So we're taking that model at the end of the day and there's a ton of farmers and, and there's not very many extractors in the state of Alabama or in the state of Florida yet or some of these other states because the bottleneck's where the extraction is. The reason that I, we're coming into Florida today, I, I actually spent most of my life in Florida. As a child, I grew up in Panama City, went to high school in Daytona Beach, and then I went to University of Florida in the early 90s and spent you know 15 years there. Um, my wife is from Albany, Georgia, so that's how we ended up coming up here. My mother actually lives over in Cottondale. So North Florida is very important to me. It's near and dear to my heart. So if we have an opportunity to help the farmers, uh, or if there are gaps in things, you know, we'll be more than happy to do so. There's more than enough biomass that's going to be extracted, and we all have to work together as processors, as well as the farmers, as well as everybody across the board. I'm just going to quickly go through a few pieces of uh, extraction equipment. We're going to actually do ethanol. Our strategic partner is out of uh, Tennessee. He's been doing this for two years. He'll do about a half a million pounds of biomass this year. He's very well respected. We did a lot of research on what we felt we wanted to find in a strategic partner at the end of the day. We didn't really look at the CO2 versus the ethanol. We just wanted to find a good group of people to work with. This is a, this is a cryo generator. It basically puts your biomass in that and it, um, it brings it down to the, the gen, excuse me, the cryo component of that brings it down to minus 80 below and it draws the initial CBD oils out of the plant. This, this is a steam distiller. Basically, uh, what that does is it starts pulling solvents and, and any uh, garbage out of the plants, excuse me, out of the oils themselves. So this whole process I'm about to show you is just different machines that get it down to a really fine distillate. This is a centrifuge. We're gonna have one of those. We're gonna have, uh, in our plant, we're gonna have one of these, three of those steam distillers and eight of the uh, cryo generators. <clears throat> and this just keeps spinning. You keep spinning and getting more solvent out. You want to get as high, uh, a high a CBD count as you can in your oils. You also want to get them as clean as possible. This is a, a Heifendorf um, Rotovap. It's a, basically, it's decarboxylator. It just continues to clean out that big machine in the middle there. It just continues to clean the oil. And then this is a Pope distiller. And what that does is it gets the oil to where it's clear, and then you can take and mix it into um, tinctures, lotions, uh, creams, and different things like that. So uh, really, I, I want you guys to understand this is all relational. So having this in farming communities and building relationships with the universities and the folks that are in this business, 
You're going to have to watch out for folks that are going to try to sell you things, that are going to try to make promises they can't fulfill or do things that at the end of the day, you, you just got to be wary of. And, and I'm saying that because this is about a good people adventure. We're all in this together. This is something new around this country that we all have an opportunity to do right. The market will get flooded with this as everybody gets into it. The bottleneck's going to be a processors. You're going to have to do just like some of the other commodities and store some of this so you can get the best prices. But I think if everybody can learn that we're not really in competition so much and we got to work together on this, we'll be very successful. So um, I think that was it. So do anybody have any questions? I think everybody. Here. Yeah. Couple here. Um. Uh, the process you showed us here is for CBD oil. And, yes. And how do you get the fiber out of that one? Well, we're not. Well, basically, uh, the fir very first slide. We're not doing. What we're not focusing on initially is fiber. We're going to do research with that in the University of Georgia. It is a very expensive process to do the fiber end of it, but I'm gonna go back a few slides. So you put the biomass into this and you pull as much of the oil as you can out of it. And then you could take that and you could use it for mulch or you can use it for concrete or you can use it for any kind of dunnage that uh, somebody cattle feed or anything like that. So that'll be disposed um, out in, in different ways. But it, it's different from the fiber, so you have to you have to get it a corticator plant, and that's a the very expensive thing. But when I say that you need to be looking at that just as much as this, th that's a, that's a real deal because at the end of the day, I think that's gonna that's gonna be the really big thing when it comes to. So in know. this cryo unit, after you take out the oil, what do you do with the remaining biomass? What do you plan to do with that? Um, just dispose of it. You give it to folks who want to feed it to their animals or. You give it to folks that might want to mix it in stuff. It just it won't have anything it, much left in it. And all of the you pull all the oil, you pull all the solvents back out of it, or you could use it for mulch or just. And then like, there are no restrictions on on how you not unless the, not unless the states come up with it. No. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With you being located in Georgia, are we from Florida going to be able to market to you? So, yes. In the state of Georgia, a farmer in the state of Georgia cannot sell outside of the state of Georgia. However, we can buy biomass from outside of the state. What we plan on doing is setting up two large plants in the state of Georgia and then several satellite plants strategically placed around the state. And our goal is to do the same in Alabama, um, Mississippi, Louisiana, and as needed in North Florida. So. It just really depends on where the farmers are and where the needs are. We don't want to get in the middle of things that other folks are doing, but we all, you know, if it means putting a small lab, let's say right below Valdosta, we're going to put a small lab in Valdosta so that North, you know, those farmers in that area may be able to do stuff. So yes, sir, um, you, you'll be able to sell to us. Um, when we get our set up, we're going to be, uh, like he said earlier, we're going to start off small, but we're going to, our goal is to get to 2,500 pounds in that lab. We're going to have a secondary lab in the, in the middle of Georgia, we'll do about the same, and then we'll be able to do smaller labs just to help the farmers get it out, get it out of the fields. Because there's going to be so much biomass um, from all over the place that, that, like I said, that's the bottleneck in trying to help get farmers get their, get, get their, Get, get their uh, investment back to them as well as, as they just produce the oil. And she was right, you gotta have, we're trying to build this whole thing as vertical integration. It's a relationship from one end to the other. So when the farmer puts it in the ground to the time that person uses it, whether it's in their clothing or whether it's in their, in their oils or the foods they take, it's, it really has to be thought out and worked together, that, that whole process, so. Yes, sir. Could you cover storage after it's dried? What do you we ourselves are going to have a warehouse where we can store a million pounds and that's the big thing um, you want to it's kind of like what you do with any of these other commodities but it's going to have to be stored in a warehouse 
uh, unless we get it processed very quickly, you're going to have to store it in a warehouse that's probably 55, 60 degrees with 40, 45% humidity. And that way it'll keep just like a lot of other things. Like when we do our, uh, some of our organic grains, we have to put in cold storage just to assist so it'll keep. And the price, the price of the market kind of work back out that way as well, so. All right, thank you. Thank you um, so, I think this is interesting, but maybe not surprising. For the farmers in the room, you just want to make sure there is a processor near you, right? Um, I, I know, um, oh, discard, okay, thank you. You were, yes, you had that for me. Um, while I'm pulling up our last presentation here for Alan Witters, um, I do want to say if you weren't at the last um, at the last summit on October 2nd, we did have a panel at the end on some economic development issues, and in that discussion, we brought in the new owner of the CSX Rail Line, which is Florida Gulf Atlantic. If you have ever had any dealings with CSX in the past, um, okay, yeah, we probably didn't. They didn't. They just didn't want to play with the locals as much, quite bluntly. Um, Florida Gulf Atlantic, they will build rail spurs. They will work with us in transportation of different commodities, and they're very interested in this. That's just one example of what we're looking at. There will also be a foreign trade zone that covers our area that will help the manufacturers with this. So there's a lot more pieces of this puzzle that may help us fill in this fiber side. And with that, I'm gonna bring up Alan and uh, let you hear about his, his approach. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <coughs> How many uh, people are here to make money? <laughs> all right, good. Well, because that's what this is all about. I don't know why anybody else is here for that, but uh, maybe some healthy reasons. Um, my name is Alan Witters. I'm the CEO of uh, Gravitas Infinitum. You also see a brand called Gravitas Cannabis. Um, let's see, which button do I need here? One of these buttons. There we go. We're headquartered out of Naples. Um, we're a health and wellness holding company. Our focus, primary focus is buying nutraceutical manufacturers. Uh, along this uh, two or three year project, we also had some technology from some past companies that did biofuels extraction out of everything from hemp to pine trees, or from algae to pine trees. And uh, we've introduced that, and this is industrial scale stuff, like 400 tons a day biofuel lipid removal. Um, we're a group of technologists, scientists, and operators. Uh, we've, my team's, we've probably done $30 billion in deals. so. We're a highly experienced team in, in the business space. Um, our strategy is to acquire nutraceutical companies, uh, establish long-term buying agreements with growers, uh, be a leader in the hemp uh, whole plant processing. Uh, we want to exploit this really cool, chaotic market, okay? There's so much disinformation here that it's really easy just to, if, if you know what you're trying to get to, it's really easy just to ignore the noise. Um, we're trying to vertically integrate the industry. You've heard a lot of, about vertical integration. And again, we're back to the money again. Make long-term profits. Uh, our vertical integration and our partners and our strategic partners go all the way from seeds and seedlings. And we work on a global basis. We are also into hydroponic grows, compliance testing, which includes uh, our testing capabilities are DAA certified. They also, uh, we can do both short panel, long panel type analysis. Um, processing is the main thing that we're focused on right now. And we are working also on some refining technologies that actually will allow you to have a hot crop. We're working with the state on some areas in this where we can actually pull the THC right out of any of these oils. Because that's the proper place to do it. Testing in the field is sort of insane, all right? It's crazy, okay? Concentrate all your products, work with a certified person like we're going to be, and pull out the THC at where it's concentrated. And that way you can actually vector the products. And by the way, the THC, if anybody knows this, is worth $480,000 a liter to pharma. 
So why would you throw out that super high value product and destroy your whole crops otherwise? Those are the kind of things we're working on as a technical company. Um, commodities markets, okay? We work with groups like Hemp Benchmarks, the Kush guys, all those stuff. And uh, we wanna break, make this whole stack available to you as a farmer, down to like a one acre farmer included. Um, again, manufacturing, we're buying manufacturing companies today. And we have some brands and we also know e-commerce. I come out of the whole cloud data space, so that's why I'm probably really weird. Um, there's no scale. The systems that you hear about today, 2,500 pounds a day. Wow. That's less than half, that's a half an acre coming off of a really high production field. Okay. I'm working with people right now on systems that can do 30,000 acres over a season. Okay. And we're expecting two and a half million acres to be in the next three years brought up. There's a, the processing doesn't exist. These processors that use CO2 or solvent based processors came out of the cosmetics industry. They're narrow band select extraction systems. They extract just this one band of oil. There are 1100 molecules in the hemp plant. If you add the other little parasites that are on top of it, uh, there's another 200. And those are some really cool funguses and molds and bugs and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, we think this is a juvenile, juvenile industry. We love it because I'm a, I'm a platform builder. And uh, we think we can help optimize a whole bunch of it, business and real processes. Financial risks. You guys have heard some financial risks. When's the last time you put $13,000 an acre in the ground, Hope, hoping that it's gonna turn around, okay? By the way, nobody mentioned that this processing equipment costs you another $6,000 to $8,000 an acre in CapEx, and another eight to $9,000 an acre to run every year, all right? So you have $20,000 of uh, input costs in these acres when you're working with this stuff. Uh, so I have some questions for the audience. Who's going to invest a million dollars or more in hemp this year? Okay, we got a couple. Who's going to invest a hundred grand? We got a couple. Okay. Who's going to invest ten grand? Yep, a lot more. Okay, all right. How about a bunch of elbow grease and sweat? Uh, everybody's going to do that, right? Okay, all right. So, so here's the paradox. For every new billion dollar market, it costs three to five billion to create it. What does that tell you? Somebody else is paying for your success. That's what it tells you, if you're successful. All right? So this is, it's a great story. We're in it, we love it, we think it's great. But uh, as one gentleman said earlier, you have to be in it for the long run. This is a 10 year cycle at the smallest side of it. So, you know, don't, don't think you're gonna get rich quick on these things. The numbers you're dealing with are huge. For us to process, to build, put, build systems to process 1900 acres, which we're doing right now for a group in Arizona, it costs $53 million of our capital for the processing equipment. They're producing two pounds of bud off of each plant, 5,000 plants per acre, 19 million pounds we have to process. Also get used to some new methods of harvesting and growing. We do series cycles and programmatic growing. Let's say that your growing season is 220 days long. You have a seed that'll germinate and be harvestable in 70 days. What I'm gonna tell you to do, the first 70 days, I wanna take all your property, I want you to divide it basically into 150 plots. I want you to, because uh, there's 150 days of left to harvest after the first 70. If you go and you plant those seeds every day for 70 days, your, your cap X cost and your input costs will all be leveled and you won't have to buy a $100 million processing plant. You'll be able to actually just buy a $10 million processing plant because you can harvest every day. These seasonal harvest approaches are gonna kill a lot of this business because you have to build big giant processing plants and handling plants. 
Oh, the other thing is, is that drying. I love it. I, and I'll be going through our process in a bit. Drying is insane. The only reason you dry this stuff is to smoke it. I don't know who'd want to smoke hemp. But the other thing, the other reason you have to dry it is that if you don't dry it, you disable the ethanol or CO2 processes. You're forced to dry it because of those two processes. It's just sort of craziness. So we're introducing in Florida, we just launched this last week, Project Ultra. And basically it's a series of processing systems that go from three tons a day to 160 tons a day. Uh, programmatic planting prescriptions, we're going to work with the farmers to show them how to do that programmatic growing. Uh, we're building a materials lab or a, a global technology center down in uh, Fort Myers. And you have to understand that this plant is so smart. It has our colleges confused because the plant even changes and morphs, as we heard today. Same species, five different types of plants. What the hell? It's really smart. It's so smart that it, it, it has 1,100 molecules, and there are groups of these molecules can be vectored almost immediately into 50 different products. When you use a CO2 systems or a solvent systems, you end up with 98% waste that you have to do something with and just a small amount of stuff. The fibers are really cool. Uh, in our system, we blow up the fibers down to the molecular level. Um, so there's, it's not the stringy stuff, that macrame type things, okay? Uh, we can take the fiber directly into food products by bonding carbohydrates and proteins to it. We can take it directly into cellophane and plastics, okay? And it's, it's pretty interesting what you can do with this plant. Uh, our series of processors can take any type of biomass, uh, buds, tops, whole plants, root balls, dried, wet, green, rotten, frozen. We don't care. It, we just blow it all to hell. Uh, it's a seven-step process. Uh, you end up with three things coming out. An extrication liquor, it's got 650-some molecules, plus all those parasite molecules. Uh, water. And that's got a couple hundred molecules of sugars and carbohydrates and things, glycerins, and fiber. And there's another couple hundred molecules there that you can play with. And we, we really like this stuff because you can do a lot of things with it. You're not just relegated to selling CBD oil. And by the way, CBD oil, uh, how much did it go down last month? Anybody know? 25%. So if it does that four more months, what's it worth? Zero, right? So be really careful of that. Um, no drying required, no solvents, no temperatures, no zero waste. As soon as you start using a solvent, you start changing the ionic boundaries of all the oils. As soon as you start heating it up using, or really cold, chilling it down, you start losing a lot of the uh, uh, molecules on this stuff. Uh, all of our systems come with an app, basically. You can see how hot your crops are by plot. This data can be transmitted directly to the states, depending which state you're in, if they'll, if they'll take electronic uh, transfers. Uh, you can see your harvesting schedules. You can look at your processing and how much is being processed. And you can uh, also see what your revenue is because we tie directly into the markets with this information. We think this is really critical for you to understand, are you making money or aren't you making money? Or are you just, out being a horticulturist for the fun of it, okay? The, um, we're inviting business partnerships all the time. Uh, we, uh, we're partnering with the feds, we're partnering with the state officials, uh, counties. We also do joint ventures, and I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, we also have investment opportunities and a global technology center that we're, we're working on. Uh, a lot of it from us is for transparency. There's no reason you should be, give 50% of your crop to a processor, okay, because you're giving a lot of money away at that point. It's huge. Um, this is our plan in Florida, and we're just talking to farmers right now about doing a bunch of joint ventures, and these would be small one ton uh, an hour type systems that could handle 24 tons a day. Uh, this would be a joint venture approach. 80% of the profits go to the farmers, 20% to, to us. We provide about 60% of the capital. 
Uh, farmers are required to basically subscribe an acre. We charge, it's $2,500 an acre to subscribe and you own part of the processing. So it's a, it's a pretty easy subscription model. Um, how to get involved? If you want to get involved with us, we have a bond out there, it pays 12%. It's five year convertible, so you get a double bang out of it. Uh, you get to participate across all of our businesses, nutraceutical and joint ventures and processing. We have a, a lower risk, uh, we have a, the lowest risk is the bond. The lower risk stuff is a processing joint venture. Uh, we need to aggregate about 2,000 acres per joint venture. So if there's 2,000 acres in this room that want to have a processor, each put up 2,500 per acre and we'll throw a plant in. Uh, minimum entries, one acre. Uh, you can become a grower and we'll give you a, a buy contract. Or you can uh, just be a customer. We really don't care. Now there's where we're gonna take half of your product, okay? Um, we believe in health and wealth. And uh, any questions? Oh, it's wet, yes. No drying. It saves that whole input cost, which in some places can be 30% of the input cost. Yeah. And then 2,000, like you said, 2,000 acres, so collectively in this room, it's, it's forming a cooperative effectively, right? A joint, uh, we don't, we want to say cooperative. This is a joint, we're not communist yet. Um, but it's a joint venture and it's equity, but it's using acres as a unit of that equity. And we're working with the lawyers right now where all joint ventures would actually be sharing a risk pool. Oh, I forgot some other things. We, we can offer, in this program, we offer two types of crop insurance. One is event weather-based crop insurance, and another one is a harvest-based insurances. So there's some other things there we do. Uh, who wants to go? Oh, excuse me? For what? Yeah, I don't know. You'd have to get that bitted out. Depends where you are, where you're located. This, this technology has been used for about 30 or 40 years in some other businesses. We adapted it to the hemp business, and we're building the first five systems right now. No, not legal to have one right now.